So today the um, we're we're moving now. Oh, by the way, um, the the next Jupyter notebook is posted um, in module two of the GitHub repository. If you haven't seen it already, um, essentially, like I mentioned. Um, what you will be doing is taking the carbon model that we worked on last um, last class and I'll stand up for at least a little while while um, till my I also messed up my back so um, and you'll be adding anthropogenic emissions that's that are actual data and then sort of investigating where those anthropogenic emissions go in the global uh, climate system um, and then. You'll also be examining sort of some future, very highly stylized uh, trajectories for um, uh, mitigation of, of CO2 emissions. So you'll look at one, uh, uh, one scenario that is a net zero by 2030 scenario, one that's a net zero by uh, 2050, and one that's a no emissions growth, right? So basically capped emissions and um, and, and looking at what those do to the, the carbon system, okay? Okay, so today we're gonna get into a very, um, a large class of uh, physical process models that are known as diffusion problems. For now, we're gonna look at diffusion in, in one dimension. We're gonna devi um, derive both kind of the governing equations um, of the of a diffusion of a 1d diffusion process and we're going to go further and start um, deriving the actual numerical solutions to um, solving diffusion like equations okay um, and we're going to spend two weeks in this 1d diffusion process module because it's super important um, a lot of problems i hope you will see can be treated as diffusion problems even when they're not diffusion problems, right? Or some problems, some real world phenomena that are kind of um, non-linear diffusion problems are treated as linear diffusion problems just because the math works out really nicely and we know how diffusion problems behave. Um, we, have, we can make some pretty good predictions about that. Um, and then we can sort of try and understand our departures from linear diffusion in the real world by kind of collecting measurements and comparing them, okay? So um, this is 1D diffusion, and I have had this semester the worst time spelling diffusion. Um, I always want to put one F and two S's, that's not right, um, diffusion. Okay, so that's... That's the, that's the problem. And so a, a diffusive process, and in particular, a linear diffusion process, is, is one in which the transport of something, right, of some material, it might be heat, okay, it might be water, it might be a contaminant, it might be a contaminant in water, it might be contaminant in air, right? Um, but it's, it's one in which um, the transport, so the rate of transport of a material is directly proportional. So we'll say um, little q, this is uh, the flux per unit area. Flux per unit area. Um, and that is going to be proportional to some uh, constant or, you know, we'll talk about what that constant is in a second, but it's proportional to some gradient in space, right? So if we're transporting, for instance, um, uh, heat, right? This might be the, the temperature in some direction, we'll call it X, right? And this is what's known as a, a partial derivative. So we call this the spatial, this is a spatial gradient. Okay, and, and the partial derivative here um, often implies, although we're for this week and next week only gonna be looking in one direction, 
the partial derivative here is meant to imply that, that temperature may vary in other dimensions, right? It may vary in, in fact, y and in z, okay? Okay, so this is the flux per unit area, right? And this gradient is going to have units of something like, um, in this case, it would be temperature, so something like uh, Kelvin per meter, right? Okay. So, and, and the flux here, right, so this would be, um, the, the flux is going to be in something, in this case, something like, you know, joules per second, right? So that would be a flux of energy, okay? And if we go a step further, right, and we say that this is, in fact, um, a, a linear diffusive process, Right, we, we're going to now say that our, our transport rate Q is equal to some constant, okay, uh, we'll just call it K here, times that gradient, dt dx, okay. Okay, so this is, a, this is what the, the transport in a diffusive process will look like, okay. And um, it turns out that, that relationships that look like this, right, that take this form, the transport equals co some constant times a gradient, right, appear um, all over the place, right? So, uh, for instance, for us hydrologists, right, Darcy's Law, the flux of water, uh, Q... Let's just put D for Darcy. Whoops. Q. Q. D for Darcy is equal to K times the derivative of, or the gradient of uh, the, the potentiometric head, right? The hydraulic head in space, right? And what is that K called for those hydrologists out there? I need to sit, but I need to see people, so. Yeah, that's, that's the hydraulic conductivity, right? Okay, so that's the hydraulic, the hydraulic conductivity. So this is Darcy's Law. Right? Um, anybody else know a relationship that takes this form? Okay, and what, what does that, well, uh, the, so yes, you're right. The exponential decay um, is a solution to a diffusive problem, right? But is there, I'm, um, I guess what I'm asking, is there a physical law Yes. Yep. Yeah. So um, this is uh, so the heat flux, right? So Q. Uh, why is it keep Q is equal to some K times dt dx, right? Where this is the this is um, uh, this is uh, uh, Newtonian. Right, like Newton, this is Newton's heating. Yeah, Newton's law of heating. Yeah, Newton's law of heating or cooling. Yeah, Newton's law. Newton's heating. Now this, this is not Newton's law of cooling. What's that? It's not um, Newton's law of cooling. Yeah. Because Newton's law of cooling is temperature finding time. Yeah. Okay. This um, this is spatial. So this is like. Um, this is for conductivity in solids. Yeah. This is. Um, this is just like we'll we'll just call this like heat flow, right? So this is a diffusive heat flow, and in fact, this is what we're going to do in this module. Here is it. 
right? Yeah, so generally this is fix law, right? But it shows up a lot of places. So this is fix raw, right? Um, uh, for those that are geomorphologists, um, in the next module, um, it'll show up as a sediment transport relation. And it'll, it takes the form again, like the sediment, the sediment transport rate is equal to some constant, usually denoted D times DZ DX, right? And what's DZ DX? It's just the topographic slope, right? So, so you know, th that again is sort of an, in, in, um, a lot of times we apply intuitive reasoning to this, the steeper the slope, the, the faster the sediment transport rate, right? Um, and, and then we sort of solve it under the assumption that it acts as a diffusive process. And then we might go into the landscape and look at, you know, elevation, digital elevation models and say, hey, do these behave according to the, you know, are the, is the distribution of slopes that we find consistent with the treatment of uh, sediment transport as a diffusive process? And in some parts of the world, it, it does. It's very diffusive, um, which you get as rolling hill topography. And in some places it's not, right? And then you have to come up with other sort of sediment transport laws. Is that yep. like how sand dunes Yeah, exactly. So, so the, the um, one of the, in the next chapter, you're gonna read about, um, you know, uh, um, the evolution of sand dunes as kind of a diffusive process, right? Okay. Okay, so these kinds of relationships show, show up in, in all kinds of, problems. Um, heat diffusion is one that kind of all, almost universally all of us encounter. What we're going to be investigating in this module is the diffusion of heat into a permafrost um, and asking ourselves at what depths in the soil does the temperature start to exceed zero and why might that be important? What happens when the temperature in a permafrost exceeds zero Celsius? starts the the water there right the name permafrost the frost part in part implies that there's water right so it implies that the water starts to to thaw right and the permafrost starts to thaw that water becomes mobile all of a sudden okay okay so um and in fact uh, ohm's law takes this form right um the current is equal to some resistance times a potential that potential is actually a gradient um, all kinds of laws, all kinds of laws in science and engineering take this form. Okay. All right. So let's draw the setup that we're going to address in, in class today. Okay. So in, in this module, so let's draw this permafrost soil, right? We're just going to draw a box here. It has some thickness, okay. Um, we'll call this, uh, uh, what do I wanna call this? Um, capital Z, okay. And um, here we're going to denote the direction is Z. Okay, this is the top. So up here, this would be the top. This corresponds to the atmosphere. Okay, and the bottom here is just, um, by design, we're gonna say that we're gonna go deep enough into the soil so that uh, the, the bottom is not going to be influenced by the out atmosphere, right? So the, you know, how deep that is, um, how, how deep we go into the soil is a product of kind of where you are on the earth and what, you know, what the materials of this, what the material properties are of this soil, of this permafrost. But um, we, what we will do is just sort of pick a value and test, right? We'll see, like, does, you know, does, does the atmosphere have a big influence on the temperatures nearby, you know, the, the bottom here? So, um, 
Uh, so this is uh, deep enough um, to be out of atmospheric influence. Okay. Okay, so uh, this permafrost Okay, it has some properties associated with it. We are going to assume that these properties are constant as just a starting place. Um, that makes the numerical solution that much easier as you might imagine. But again, this is one of those things that um, in the real world you might start off because it's just a model. We're just, you know, wasting, if, if we do it and we're wrong, we're just wasting, you know, CPU time and some memory, we're wasting a little bit of energy, right? Um, but we can always compare those solutions under our assumptions, under our restrictive assumptions to the real world and say, hey, how well does this fit? You know, does this, does this, does the way we're treating it um, fit it? And if not, what do we need to do to make it better, okay? Okay, so what are the properties of this, this material and, um, and, and what, what role do they play? Okay, so um, first is, is rho, and rho is what is called the bulk density. Oops. Bulk density. And it has units of kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, it has um, a heat capacity. We're going to call this C. And uh, the heat capacity C, this is the, the uh, soil, we'll call this the specific. Specific usually denotes that it's a per unit mass quantity. Um, so it's the specific heat. Ugh. Why is that keep happening? Specific heat capacity. Okay. And this will have units of uh, like joules per kilogram Kelvin. Right. Um, and what those units imply is that this is the amount of energy that the soil will store per unit mass as you raise its temperature by one degree Kelvin, okay? And then the last one is the so-called thermal conductivity. The thermal conductivity. And this will have units of uh, joules, and let me check, double check my units here. I don't want to lie. Okay, so the, the units will be uh, 
Oops, what did I just do? Actually, watts per meter Kelvin. And um, if you remember, watts are just joules per second, right? So, so this is actually joules per meter Kelvin second. Okay. Okay, so um, let's start to put together. So what we'll do, what we're about to do is we're about to examine a slice of this permafrost soil that has dimensions of, of DZ, right? So this is kind of your infinitesimally thin layer of, of soil. And what we're going to do is we're, we're going to take that piece of soil, that slice of soil, and we're going to apply a energy conservation argument, right? So we're going to just account for the energy that, um, uh, the energy that comes out, the energy that, uh, the energy that comes in, the energy that leaves, and the balance between that will result in a change in energy per unit time, energy storage per unit time, okay? Um, and we'll then sort of have our, our governing equation, okay? Okay. So if we take that if we take that slice here, right? So I'm gonna take this slice of soil, right? So this has a thickness of dz, and there's some am amount of energy that's coming in. We'll call that Q, uh, and we'll call that, uh, Q, I'm going to call this Q plus. So, right, if we, there's different nomenclature term, you know, kind of terminology you can use to denote this. Mathematicians will use one thing and engineers will use another. I'm going to use plus here for the kind of upstream or up gradient side of my, of my slice of soil. So that's the heat flux and the the heat flux coming out is is Q minus. Okay. And um, you know this uh, we're going to be also doing this if you remember Q is a per unit area quantity so. Some folks might actually extend the, the boxes here to be like a finite area here of this slice. I'm just going to use cues here and just say that we're doing this on a per unit area basis. So in principle, you know, there's no kind of, this little slice doesn't have any area, right? It, we're, we're doing this kind of at a, at a point as it were, okay? Okay, so now what we need to do is, is do our accounting, right, such that um, the, um, the energy flux in minus the energy flux out is balanced by a change in energy storage. Okay. And um, there could be um, sources, some sources and sinks here, right? So we could have a term here that's sources and sinks. We'll start off with, with no sources and sinks. 
right? That, that would mean, you know, for instance, if there was uh, a heating element that was sort of placed right here, um, you know, like a, a hot wire, right, that we're pumping energy in, um, that would be a, a source of energy. But for now, we'll, we'll not include any, any sources, okay? If, you, if this were a groundwater model, the sources or sinks might be extraction from a well or injection to a well. Okay, okay so now let's start to, to apply some mathematics here. Okay, so our change in energy storage um, is, is going to be, so the, the fundamental... Um, the fundamental variable that we keep track of, that keeps track of energy, right? So if um, in, in COVID times, right, um, when somebody checks your temperature before you come into a room, if your temperature is, is above normal, what, is that, what does that imply um, about what's going on inside your body, right? It, it means your metabolism is, is upregulated, right? Like your, your energy is, your body is burning more energy kind of trying to fight off infection, right? So temperature is, is what we call a macroscopic measure of energy content. If you measure, you know, if you measure the temperature of something, you know it's energy relative to something else, okay? Um, and so, so it's temperature that we keep track of. So the variable we'll be keeping track of is dt, dt, cap t here being temperature, little t here being time. And to convert that to an actual energy storage, right, um, we would be multiplying by rho times c. So the bulk density times the, um, uh, times the um, heat capacity, and when you uh, mix all those, um, those units together, what you wind up getting is, you know, an, an energy per unit time, right? Like a joules per time, okay? And that is equal to, and we're going to start to insert our, um, our flux transport relationships here, right? So we're going to take one more step here and say that this is equal to, The change in, right, so this is, you know, again, we're compressing this down to an infinitesimally thin region. So this is the, um, this is the thermal conductivity, oops, okay, the thermal conductivity times the gradient in temperature, dt, dz, and we're gonna, this is on the plus side here, so this is on the top, minus k, k times dt dz at the bottom, okay? And let me move this over here. Um, and so the other thing to bear in mind here, right, is that um, as, we, as we make delta Z, as we make this delta Z go to zero, right, what we're, what we're doing basically, this difference amounts to taking the derivative of our, of our heat flux term with respect to Z, okay? So what we can do is say that Rho C DT DT is equal to the derivative with respect to Z of K times DT DZ. Okay. Okay. Now this gets us very close to where we, we want to be before we take our five minute break. But I want to stop and make a comment here, okay? Because what did we assume about the thermal conductivity? 
for right now that it's constant. There are many problems in the real world where K is not constant, right? The thermal conductivity may depend on the temperature itself. That's, um, and sometimes, um, or in general, that conductivity rate depends on, you know, whatever this variable is here, whether that's temperature or uh, moisture content or potentiometric head. And that whole class of problems are, are nonlinear partial differential equations. Um, depending on these coefficients, it, it can be hyperbolic or parabolic um, or elliptical. Um, but those problems are a step harder to solve. Okay? And they get into a lot of my mathematics folks here will sort of appreciate that it's a whole sort of additional set of classes, right? So partial differential equations, you get into some of that. Um, the kind of most common one that we know about as hydrologists, right, is the so-called Richards equation. So how many of you have heard of Richards equation? Describes infiltration of water into the soil, into an unsaturated soil. And in Richards equation, this hydraulic, the hydraulic conductivity of the soil depends on how much moisture is in it, right? So the more moisture you have in the soil, the more water can flow through it because you have all of these kind of connected pores, pore spaces with water in them, and it's sort of highly nonlinear, right? Which is the unfortunate thing. So you make a small mistake in K and you get a big mistake in your, you know, your water flux term, okay? So for now though, right, this is always a hypothesis that we can test. We have assumed that K is constant, which means that it can come out, out of this derivative. And the diffusion equation that we get is, oh, rho times C times the change in temperature with respect to time. And that equals K times the second derivative of temperature with respect to Z, okay? So this is our governing equation for heat diffusion into a soil, assuming that we have constant bulk density, specific heat capacity, and thermal conductivity, okay? Now, once we come back, we'll, we're up for a break now. Once we come back, we will apply a numerical solution to this. So today we're gonna to apply one form of a numerical solution to it, kind of the most straightforward way of doing it. And then on Tuesday, um, so next week, this Thursday, we'll spend time with um, an example notebook. Next Tuesday, we'll apply another form of a numerical solution to this equation. Um, but um, yeah, what did I wanna say about Diffusion problems, okay? So, oh, so, um, so if you think about it, right, um, if, if we have a relationship or if we have a function that is the temperature as a function of depth, right, um, our heat flux rate is just some constant times the curvature of that relationship, right? The first derivative is the slope of that temperature profile. The second derivative is the curvature, right? So this... This thing here has a very cool name, right? This is known as the Laplacian, right? Um, if you know T, so for those of you that have ever, um, any, any of you that have done any kind of image processing, even like on your phone, right? Um, when it's using a smoothing filter, right? When it's not hashtag no filter, it's hashtag filter. Um, what you're actually doing is um, frequently you're just taking the Laplacian of your image, right? You're smoothing it out by taking the curvature. Okay, so you're, you're actually, what you're actually doing, you can think about is doing a two-dimensional diffusion of that temperature, okay? Okay, let's pause there. We're gonna come back and start setting up the numerical solution. Um, so strictly speaking, right, if, if this were 
truly a one-dimensional problem, we would only need to take the, deriv like the, the, um, the total derivative and not the partial. Um, usually, just by convention, even when we're doing um, numerical, um, even when we're only solving problems in one dimension that we know to often be two-dimensional, we still use the partial just, to, just as more of a kind of reminder that like, hey, t might actually vary in x and y here. So it's not the mathematically most correct thing, but um, it's kind of a, a signal that like, hey, this in fact may, may vary in x, y, and z. Okay, let's go ahead and keep going. So um, what, what we have to do now, right, is if we take, um, if we take, an, if we take note here, um, so uh, we have a, a temporal derivative And we have a spatial derivative here as well. We actually have, have a, a second spatial derivative. Okay. Second spatial derivative. Okay. So, um, so we need to be careful in keeping track of both our spatial and temporal dimensions, our steps, where we're at, okay? So I'm going to draw a diagram and introduce some notation that will help us keep track of this, okay? So unlike, and it's, it's important to sort of stop here and say that unlike our box model, right, where we were just modeling the kind of total mixed amount of carbon in our global climate system, now we actually are going to be resolving the vertical distribution of temperature in our permafrost, right? So we now actually care about the spatial dimensions of, of, our, um, of our model domain, okay? And so that's gonna be different. We're gonna be solving not only at, at time points, but at spatial points as well, okay? So in, in this case, I'm going to, and the, the dot grid here is gonna help me. So I'm going to start illustrating this as, as a grid, right? So we have some points on this grid. Okay, so I'll just fill this in a little. Okay, so, and this here is going to be our spatial dimension. And this here is going to be our temporal dimension. And we're going to use the, the notation here that um, this would be the, the jth spatial location and the, so this is the ith, this is i plus one, this is i plus two, so on and so forth, right? So this would be j plus one, j minus one, okay? And so, um, let's see, is this, 
it doesn't do anything. Okay, but there was like a little pointy thing. Um, and so, what about this? this? Sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, these, this column here, right, is um, all of the point, you know, a single point in my spatial domain at all times. Okay. And at the same time, if I go this way, this is all of the points in my modeling domain at a particular time, okay? So for instance, if we highlight, let me box in this point here, right? This would be the temperature at the jth, jth point and the ith time. Okay, so that's, that's how we're going to denote our, our temperatures. The space is going to be the subscript. The time is going to be the superscript. Okay, so let's, um, the other thing that I want to do real quick is get, if we revisit our um, governing equation, um, if I combine my terms K, rho, and C, right, they're all constant, I can, I can just combine them. I can rewrite my equation now. as dt, oops, oops, dt dt equal to k over rho c times the second derivative of t with respect to depth. And this here, I'm going to call my diff diffusivity. D is diffusivity. Okay. So this reduces to dt dt equals some constant times All right, so if we go back up to our notation here, I'm gonna start with the temporal derivative, right? So I wanna, I wanna use this notation here to just, to start off with, um, with this, uh, with the temporal derivative, okay? So, in the, so we're gonna start at the jth point, but we're gonna consider the temporal derivative, okay? So starting at the jth point. Okay, so our dt, dt equals t, at i plus one, location j, minus t at time i, location j. And that's all gonna be divided by a delta t. Right, that we as modelers are going to pick. Okay. So that's the that one that one was relatively easy. Okay. So we now have done the left side 
of this equation. So the left-hand side is, is done. Okay. So now we need to do the right-hand side of this equation, which is a little bit more complicated. Okay. So we're now going to consider the jth point again. So starting at the jth point, um, the second derivative is approximated as follows. Okay. So we know how to take a um, a temporal derivative and a first derivative, right? This is the first derivative in time. Okay. Now we need to take a second derivative in space. So what I want to do here is lay out the three points that I'm going to be using for my spatial derivative and say that this is j, j minus one and j plus one. And if I imagine here, right, there's kind of this division point here. Okay, at j minus a half and j plus a half. What I'm first going to do is take the derivative, the finite difference approximation to the derivative at j minus a half, and then I'm going to take that's the derivative at j plus a half, and then I'm going to take the derivative of that to get the second derivative. Okay, so I'm going to center my second derivative in space, okay? All right, what does that look like? So, dt dz at j minus a half is going to be approximated as t at j minus t at j minus one over delta z. Do y'all see that? So I've taken the finite difference at these two points here to get the finite difference approximation to the derivative at this point j minus one half. Okay, so similarly, if I do a finite difference approximation to the derivative at j plus a half, what would that be? That would just be the temperature at j plus one minus the temperature at j, oops, over delta z. Okay. And now I need to take the derivative of those at j. Right? So I need I need to 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 come up with a finite difference approximation to the second derivative. 
And so what I want to do is I want to say, okay, so the second derivative of temperature with respect to depth is going to be approximated as the difference of the approximate derivatives at j plus a half and j minus a half, right? So I'm just gonna do the finite difference of these finite differences, okay? So if, I, if I'm starting at j plus a half, I would have, okay, so the first part of that is t at j plus one minus t at j over delta z. There's the first part. Ah, I need to write smaller. Okay, so t at j plus one minus t at j over delta z minus Okay, the finite difference approximation for the derivative at j minus a half, which is t at j minus t at j minus one over delta z. And then all of that will be over delta z. Okay, everybody with me? Okay, so I can simplify this, right? This is just algebra to simple this, simplify this. So I can come up with an approximation of my second derivative, right? I can just distribute this minus sign through, right? These delta z's all go to the bottom. Okay, so what I wind up with is t at j plus one minus two t's at j plus t at j minus one all over delta z squared. Okay. So this is what's known as a centered in space, or CS approximation to the second derivative. So now what I need to do is, so, so now I've taken care of the spatial derivative. I need to just put this approximation for the second derivative together with my approximation for the temporal derivative. Oop, nope, up here. And then I just need to be careful about what time I'm doing this second derivative at. And then it reduces to an algebraic problem. Okay, so let's do that. Let's put those together. So putting it together. I have T at J time I plus one. minus t at j time i, and that's going to be equal to, and that's uh, divided by delta t, and that's gonna be equal to a constant, the diffusivity, if you remember. And then our second derivative, t, j plus one 
minus 2 t at j plus t at j minus 1 over delta z squared. Okay. And for now, we don't have to do this. And next week, we're going to do the opposite of this choice. The choice that we will make is that we will compute this spatial derivative at the ith time step, right? The current time step. So i, i, i. Okay. So when we do this, I'm going to convince you in a second that um, if we know everything, if we know the temperature distribution at the ith time step, if we know the initial condition, these are all known. All right, let me highlight this for the movie, right? So if we know the initial condition, everything that's at the ith time step is known. And this becomes a pretty straightforward algebraic relationship, right? So if we, if we do the math, we get T at location J at the I plus one-th time step is just equal to T at the ith time step in the jth spatial location plus some constants here, d times delta t over delta z squared times t j plus 1 time i minus 2t j time i plus t at j minus 1 time i. Oops. Okay. Okay, so a couple of quick terminology things for us here. So this derivative choice that we made we d by, by computing the spatial derivative at time i, we've decided that we are moving forward in time, right? We're, we're marching forward. So this is a forward time approximation. And as I already mentioned, this is a centered space approximation to the spatial derivative. So this is frequently known as an FT, forward time centered space solution forward time centered space. Okay. The other key thing about this is that because we have been able to rearrange all our terms to solve point by point, right, moving on to the jth time step, or j spatial step moving on to the ith time step, right? And all we need to know is the temperatures around the j spatial location at the ith time step. This is known as an explicit solution. Explicit. Okay. And that's exactly the notebook we're going to be going through on Thursday. Okay. So just to reiterate a couple things, I want to redraw our kind of dot diagram again and show you kind of what we are doing. I'm going to draw it slightly different this time. Okay, so here are, I'm going to, sp I'll space it out a little bit more. So and if I draw it here as a filled in dot, that means that it's known. And if I draw it here as a 
open circle, it's unknown. Okay. So if this is the jth location at the ith time, this is the j minus one location at the ith time, and this is the j plus one location at the ith time. Okay. What we are solving for, right, um, if you look back at this equation, all of these filled in dots go into solving for this point here. Right? Similarly, if we wanted to solve at this point, Right, if we, if we wanted to solve at this point here, we would be needing to know the value of temperature at the previous time step at this location, this location, and this location. For here it would be this location, this location, and this location. Okay, and then the key important thing here is that um, if we want to know this location, either we need to, to be told it, this is our boundary condition, right, on the edge of our boundary, either we need to be told the value at the boundary, or we need some other information, right? We need, um, we need for instance, a, a ghost node out here, right, that we can borrow from to be able to kind of approximate this value on the boundary, right? So these are our boundary conditions. And we'll either specify them by just getting the value, right? I just tell you what the temperature is at the top and at the bottom, or I tell you what the heat flux is I give you some amount of joules that move into the soil or some amount of watts, and you use that to infer what kind of the temperature at sort of a ghost node would be to, to allow for that heat flux, right? What's the temperature gradient that can support that heat flux? Okay, those are two different kinds of boundary conditions. One's a so-called Dirichlet, and the other's a von Neumann. Okay. okay, so there's a lot of caveats with this explicit solution, and we're going to find that and see that on Tuesday. Um, this this uh, set of constants here all together, um, we frequently lump them together into something called like alpha or S in your book, right? Um, and the value of this can determine whether or not this solution is stable. And what that has to do with is the, the magnitude of your diffusivity and its relationship to the temporal and the spatial steps, right? So what you'll see is that if you want a big spatial step, you're going to have to pick a small time step. If you want a big temporal step, you're gonna to have to pick a small spatial step. And if you change the diffusivity, it might change how you have to resolve either time or space. And we'll talk about some reasons for that, okay? Okay. Any questions? The last part, is that talking about um, the forward? Like, I can't do it again. The forward, the forward method and the backward method? Yeah, so... And yeah, so the, the back... Euler's. Oh, yeah, Euler, yeah. So Euler. we used a forward Euler approximation to the temporal derivative, right? Yeah. This is forward... This is forward... Uh, for, a forward time, or forward Euler. Next week, we will do backward Euler, right? And so all of a sudden, we're going to have... Some of the signs will change, and we'll have a bunch of I plus ones and an I... And when we solve that, we have to revert to a, a matrix inversion, 
Okay, so we'll get into a little algebra doing that next week. And it turns out that that implicit method is always stable. It's so-called unconditionally stable. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that. What you have to worry about is solving a whole bunch of additional equations mathematically. So, okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you Thursday.